Turn with me, please, in your Bibles this morning as we begin to the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Those of you who know your Bibles and have read through the scriptures know very well that the Bible never tells us what a crucifixion is. When you look at all four Gospels, they each one say something like, and they crucified him. It doesn't say what they did. It doesn't tell you what they did. It just says, and they crucified him. But the Gospels do tell us, in several instances, that he carried his own cross and that he bore the cross to Golgotha himself or that he had help on the way with one carrying the cross for him. Now we don't know exactly what that meant. Because many people believe that they would not have spent all of the time and the expense to use an entire full cross. But rather, he would likely have only carried the cross beam on his shoulder. I know R.C. Sproul was adamant that he only carried the beam. He didn't carry the whole cross. But whether he carried the beam or the cross, we do know that it says he carried the cross. He went out bearing his cross. So we know that given in the Gospels telling us that he carried the cross. Yet it never says that when he got to Calvary, Golgotha, that they drove the spikes through his wrist, which would have been what they would have done. It doesn't tell us that. It doesn't tell us that they drove the spikes in his hands or in his feet, or that they, uh, that it does tell us that he was lifted up, but it doesn't tell us anything about the driving of the spikes into his hands and to his feet. However, when you think about Jesus showing himself to the disciples following his resurrection, what did he show them? He showed them his hands to show that the spikes had been driven through his hands. And he showed them his side. Remember where he was speared, where the spear went into his side. But he showed them his hands. Now, what does that tell you about what the disciples knew? The disciples knew exactly what a crucifixion was. Because they knew somebody who had been crucified would have had spikes driven through their hands. And so when Jesus shows his disciples his hands in the side, he's telling us that they knew what a crucifixion was. And that someone who was crucified would have had spikes driven through their hands. This and history tells us what a crucifixion was. And the crucifixion was a horrible, cruel form of torturous execution. And everybody living in Jerusalem, in the, in the uh, confines of the Roman Empire at that time, knew what a crucifixion was. They theorized that millions of men and women were crucified that they were crucified on a regular basis. So now with that in mind, look what Jesus says in Matthew 16 and verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, 
and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. But what did Jesus say? Anyone who wishes to come after me must deny himself and take up his cross. My point is, they knew exactly what that meant. They knew that Jesus was talking about a cruel, horrible form of execution. Something involving pain. Something involving torture. This is what it meant to take up your cross. He's telling them that following him was not going to be easy. Following Christ was not said to be a time of ease and fun. He said it's a time of taking up your cross. It's almost as if he was signing up for torture if you were following him. Now this is what Jesus said. That if you follow after me, if you wish to follow after me, you, you would deny yourself and take up your cross and follow after me. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, and whoever wishes to lose his life for my sake will find it. The Bible tells us that there's a cost to discipleship. It is not health and wealth and ease, as some people are teaching today. It is not what some people say, that if you come to Jesus, all of your troubles will be over. The Bible never says that. Jesus never says that. And in the passage that we have been studying, if you turn back with me again to Romans chapter 5, this is what Paul is speaking of. It's part of what he's telling us here in verse 3. And not only this, but we also exalt in our tribulations. We exalt in our tribulations. So exalting or having grace to exalt in our time of trials is number six of the blessings we receive as children of God given in this passage. Peace with God, access to God, security in our salvation by God, standing for God's grace, exalting in the glory of God, and grace to exalt in the time of trial. This is what he speaks of now in verse 3, 4, and 5. We exalt in our time of tribulation. It is so different from what the modern church is telling people that I actually call the first heading here the concept so contrary. So contrary to the teaching today that if you come to Christ you'll have uh, peace and pleasure and that's not exactly what Jesus says and that's not what Paul says here. He says in fact the language is that we will have tribulation, that is affliction, persecution. It is the same word Jesus used in John when he said, in this world you will have tribulation. And then he says, begins to teach us these lessons, telling us that what comes from these times of persecution and tribulation. As he goes on and says, knowing that tribulations bring about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So he goes on to explain what this, per this tribulation brings to the Christian. And I remind you that the lessons that he's giving here are, bring out several points that he is not saying. He's not saying that Every, only Christians are going to suffer persecution. That's not what he's saying. That only Christians will suffer persecution. He's not saying that persecution or tribulation is fun. He's not saying that it's something that we should look forward to. He's not telling us that it's going to be a good time. He's not saying that we should enjoy going through times of persecution. We should not. We do not. That would be foolish. Right now, some of our families are going through times of trial. And it's not fun. It's not a good time. It's not a time that we long for, desire, or anything like that. It's difficult. It's hard. 
And so he's not saying that going through persecution is fun. He's not saying that it is constant, that we're always going to have persecution. And he's not saying that every persecution is going to be horrible. Some are less than others. But he is telling us how Christians should face their times of trial and persecution or tribulation. He is telling us that a Christian will exalt in them. And that's the same language that he used in verse 2 when he said exalt in our hope of the glory of God. We exalt in our tribulation. That is, we rejoice. We embrace, we understand, we glory even in it. That's what the word means. And so last Lord's Day, we looked at several examples from the scriptures of this teaching that we exalt in them. And remember, it's not we grin and bear it. It's not we just bear up under the load. We glory in it. It's so contrary to what we think of today. Well, we saw a couple of passages last, last, last Lord's Days where Jesus taught that men ought to rejoice and be glad when they suffer persecution for Christ. And then from the book of Acts, how the uh, apostles suffered and they were counted worthy to suffer for Christ. And they were glad that they were counted worthy to suffer for Christ. And we even saw in Paul's life how he said, I would glory in my tribulation, that I would embrace my weakness. The early church understood suffering for Christ was a part of being a Christian. They embraced it. They wore it as a badge of honor. So different from today. Today the church teaches that you get healthy and wealthy and that everything will be fun if you're a Christian. Or if you give to our ministry. It's just not so. It's just not what the Bible teaches. And now today I want to turn from that understanding of the concept. Of rejoicing or glorying or exulting in our tribulations. To beginning to understand the reasons why Christians go through times of trials. To see why Christians suffer for Christ and what it does for them and what it brings for them. Now, this passage, Paul tells us a couple of reasons that I mentioned already, that they bring about perseverance, and perseverance brings about proven character, and proven character brings about hope. But there is an underlying reason. There is an underlying reason that I really believe that we have to embrace and understand first and foremost of all. Why do we go through times of trial? Why do Christians suffer from time to time? I want to begin with this underlying reason, a doctrinal stance and a doctrinal understanding which seems to frighten people today and it is so common and so central to our faith. It is the sovereignty of God. God is involved with every aspect of our life. This is what we find in the scriptures. And so even if you're talking about going through a trial, God is sovereign. God is in control. The God of the Bible is in control of all things. It is a central understanding of who God is as God. He is in control of all things. Some years ago, I went to a funeral. A local pastor had passed away, had gone to heaven. And the local churches gathered for a funeral for this gentleman. And I walked in and was familiar with many of the men, many of the fellow pastors from around the area who were there. But one young man came in and sat down next to me and said, I, I, I don't recognize you. I don't know who you are. I, I, I understand you're a pastor. Who are you? 
and I told him who I was and what church I pastored. And he said, oh, you're that sovereignty of God church. And I really wanted to say to him, you're not? You don't believe in the sovereignty of God? What God do you worship? What God do you bow before? Because if he's not sovereign, he's not God. This is a central part of who God is. He is in control. What I want for us to do, at least for a few moments, is to see how this doctrine plays into our current study on going through trials. We must see how God deals with us in these matters. So if you would take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 10 and that passage we read a little while ago. Matthew chapter 10. As we see that nothing happens without the sovereign design of God. I often wonder what people who deny the sovereignty of God feel when they read a text like this, or if they just miss it completely. Here we have before us what is called in the scriptures, or what is called in the heading here, the meaning of discipleship. And we began our reading in verse 24. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. But we read those. I want to follow it down now to what our Lord Jesus says in the text in verse 29. In verse 29, he says, Are not two sparrows sold for a cent? That's not very much. Two sparrows, one cent. Half a cent each. You know what a sparrow is? A little bird. Just a tiny little bird. Now, there's a reason that Jesus spoke of a tiny little bird. How many times do you notice all the birds that are around? I mean, sometimes when there's a lot of them, you may notice. But there's birds flying around us all the time. You go outside in the air, they're flying around. Sometimes you look at them, look at the little bird. Look at we, we were, you know, you go to Bush Gardens, they're always trying to get the food that you leave. There, there are birds everywhere. They're all around us. And this is the point that Jesus is making. Sparrows, they're so small, they're so insignificant. They're so two of them for a penny. And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. What does that mean? Not even this tiny, little, insignificant bird dies without the exact, expressed, sovereign God in control. Not one of them will fall to the ground without your father's involvement. Nothing dies apart from the control of God. And that's a hard thing to accept sometimes. But this is what Jesus is saying. Not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. All right, Jesus, let's take it from a sparrow to you. Verse 30. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. In other words, he's talking about you. And not one of the hairs of, on your head will fall to the ground without God knowing it. That's the implication. That he is in control even of you. And every aspect of you. Now, people, that's, that means that when we suffer, when we go through times of trial, when we deal with some of these things, God is there. God knows what is going on. God is involved with us and what we're having to go through. But he knows it. 
He knows why the hair falls out, whether it's worry or fear or whatever. He understands and he knows. The hairs of your head are not numbered. So, verse 31, <clears throat> excuse me, do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. You're very valuable to God. Very valuable to your Father. The simplest common things of life, the hair on your head, show that God is sovereign and that God is in control even of this. He is in control of all of these things. Now, if you would, please look at verse 28 and get some of the context involved with what Jesus is saying here. Do not fear those who kill the body and are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Discipleship costs. And people were coming after the apostles. Don't you think that Jesus knew what was going to happen after his death, burial, and resurrection, and ascension back up into heaven? People hated the disciples. People hated the apostles. Almost all of the apostles were martyred for their faith. Most all of them had to give their life for preaching and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus knew that. And so what did he say? Don't fear them who can kill the body. Fear God. Fear God and serve him. That's the message that Samuel left for Israel before King Saul took over. Fear God and serve him. That's what we're to do. Because they can't kill you if God isn't going to let them. There is no way that you can die apart from the sovereign God caring for you, controlling you, providing for you, protecting you. So God knew, Jesus knew exactly what these disciples faced. And he knows exactly what you face. Day in, day out. The simplest things, the hairs of your head are numbered. Don't all smile at me. I had hair when I was your age. And God knew every one of them. The point is that Jesus knows every trial you go through everything you face. He is involved and he is in control. And it's a concept that a lot of people hate. They don't want God to be in control. They are in control. Now it's true, man has his own free, he is a free moral agent. We have thoughts, we have desires, and we live for them, and we live and we we move and we think we're doing things exactly what we want to do, but ultimately, God is in control. A man devises his ways, but God directs his steps. Ultimately, God is in control. Let's see this a little more powerful, still in the Gospel of Matthew. If you would, please turn to Matthew chapter 28, the last chapter of the book of Matthew. Matthew 28. Listen to our Lord here in Matthew 28, verse 18. Can't take the time to go through everything here, but look at what he says. Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given me in heaven and on earth. All authority has been given to me. Pasa exousia. All authority. All authority has been given to him. What it means is all power and all strength to rule. That's what Jesus says. The risen Christ. All authority 
all power and all strength to rule has been given to him. It's been given to Jesus, the sovereign ruler of all things. He is the king of kings. Capital K, king of small K, kings. He is the ruler of all kings. He is the ruler of all governments. He is in charge. He has all authority. Jesus is indeed the ruler. There is nothing which he does not have authority over. Nothing. There is nothing which is taken away from him. I get a kick out of all of these people who try to talk about lordship salvation as if there's any other kind. Like you can just give your life to Christ and live like the devil. You can be a carnal Christian and you don't have to really bow your knee to King Jesus. But then they plead with you to do so. They say, Open all of the doors of your heart to him. As if he's not in control. As if he is not the king and the Lord over your heart, over everything. No true Christian keeps anything from Christ. He is our Savior. He is our God. He is our Lord. He is. In control and has authority over all things. Now the writer here, now our, thing, right? our Lord himself here amplifies this as he says, All authority has been given to me in heaven. In heaven. All authority has been given to Jesus in heaven itself. That is, he is the ruler of heaven. The ruler of all things in heaven. The Lord of all the created universe. And he is the ruler of the angels and the heavenly hosts in heaven. Jesus is the ruler of all things in heaven. All the heavenly hosts, all the angels, all the beings. And there is no queen. There is no queen of heaven. Jesus alone is the ruler of heaven. And he adds on earth. He is the ruler in heaven and on earth. That is that he is the ruler of all that takes place on the earth. The ruler of the physical earth. The rain, the sun, the heat, the cold, the dust. We had the Saharan dust over here in Florida lately. It's, God knows exactly where every particle of dust will land. Truck goes down the street, raises up dust. God knows where every single particle will land. Is it hard to understand? It is hard to understand. Is it hard to grasp? It is hard to grasp. How can it be? And yet, this is what the Bible teaches. That God is in control of all things. He has authority in heaven and authority on earth. He has authority and he is the ruler of all things on earth and all people on earth. As I said, the governments. He is the ruler. He is the king of kings. And he is the ruler of mankind and ultimately in control of men. Of you and me. All people. That means all things that happen to all people. And so he not only knows what will happen, he is ultimately in control. That means that when we go through trials and tribulations, they are not arbitrary. They are not simple coincidences. They are in and under the control of of our Heavenly Father. We are left to His care, the care of the loving Heavenly Father. You're not left and your life is not in the balance 
of a government or a country. You're in the care of a loving, heavenly Father. Nothing, no trial, no persecution can or will come upon you apart from his sovereign decree and his care and his purpose, as we will see. Now you remember how Paul put this in the book of Romans. Let's look there. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Now I hear people quote this passage all the time and it's like they don't even understand what they're reading. They don't even hear themselves. Romans chapter 8 and we'll start down in verse 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And to and these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Now this is what the Bible teaches, and right up front we see that what Paul is saying has to do with Christians. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. Those who are called according to His purpose. And so we're not right now talking about lost people. We're not talking about the judgment of God that comes upon men in certain places through certain ways. We're not talking about that. Right here he's talking about Christians. And that's what we want to talk about. Those who love God. And what he says is, those who have been called, those who are Christian, God causes all things. God causes all things. But it's not that it's arbitrary. It's not that it's just hocus pocus magic nonsense. God causes all things to work together for our good. He is caring for, lovingly helping. He's speaking to believers, those who love God. And what he says about them is that they are seeing God causing all things, causing them, working them together, put forth by his power, used by him. And it's for our good. This is what Paul is telling us in this passage. And we trust that he is doing these things for our good. Sometimes Christians go through times of trial. Sometimes Christians have problems in their lives. And they think God's punishing them. They think that it's a bad thing happening from God. That he's beating me because I'm, I'm not because I have not been good. This is not what God does. I am personally reading through the book of Job in my own devotions. Job went through so many things. He was hit with so many trials and difficulties. But they were not because of his sin. That's what his, his comforters tried to tell him. You're going through this because you're a bad guy. You're going through this because of your own sin. You're going through this because of your own unrighteousness. And God, Job's going, no I'm not. And God tells us, no, he's not. That's not what happened. That's not why it's going on. Ultimately, it was to bless this man, strengthen this man. And the same is true with you. We go through trials. We go through times of difficulties. We face tribulations in our life. And we learn to trust in God. In this passage in Romans 8, that's what he goes on to tell us as you look further on. In verse 31, what shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And then you, you go down 
Verse 35, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we are overwhelmingly conquered. We overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from what? The love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So all of these things that are working in your life, be their trials, be their blessings, all of these things are working in your life for your good, because of the love of God. Because he loves you like a father loves his son. And we shall see some of that next Lord's Day. In the book of Hebrews, he speaks about a father loves his son and disciplines his son. Trains his son. That's what we'll look at from here. But understand first and foremost, that as you face a trial, you do not face it by chance, coincidence, it's the hand of God because God is sovereign and his hand is involved in everything. But also understand this, that it comes from his love to teach and to train and to help us in our lives. Now I want to close by kind of looking at what we began with. And I invite you to turn with me please to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. We began by talking about the crucifixion and the cross. And here in Acts chapter 4, we have several of the apostles being arrested. And then they were released. And they came back to their brethren. Verse 23, when they had been released, they went to their own companions and reported all the chief priests and the elders said to them, and when they had heard this, they lifted up their voices to God with one accord and said, O oh Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. God is God. He is creator. He is ruler. You did all of these things. Who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, your servant said, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Now listen, for truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate. In other words, here they are gathered in this city against Jesus, Herod and Pontius Pilate. But how did they get there? Who you anointed. God put them there. They weren't there arbitrarily. They were there because God put them there, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel to do whatever they wanted. Is that what the text says? To do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. In other words, the death of Jesus Christ, the crucifixion that we learn about from history and as we see in the scriptures, the way he died, the crucifixion, the things he went through were all predestined by God. They were all part of the sovereign plan of redemption by the Holy God 
creator God of the Bible. Not an accident. They were all there, but they were all there by the hand of God. And even that horrible, cruel cross that Jesus went through was predestined by God for you, for your redemption, for your salvation. It all came to pass because of the sovereign decree and will and power of God. Now, I'm not saying at all that the cross was easy. Jesus himself prayed in Gethsemane that if this cup could pass, let it please pass. But what did he ultimately say? Not my will, but yours. We go through trials, not in none like what Jesus did. Don't, don't think I'm equating what we go through with what Jesus went through. But we go through trials. But it's not arbitrary. It's not just precocious. It's by the sovereign decree of God for our betterment for our growth, for our learning to be more dependent upon Him. Thy will be done, Father. This is the first foundational reason for, that we have to understand when we examine and go through trials, when we go through trials, God is sovereign. God is in control. Now, I've heard people mock this view. I've heard people mock the whole understanding that God is sovereign involved in our trials and make jokes about it. The fact remains, the Bible teaches that God is in control. He has authority over all things in heaven and on earth. Not one sparrow falls to the ground without him knowing. Not one hair of your head falls to the pillow without God knowing. He's in control. Bottom line, sovereignty of God in all that we go through. This is what we think of today. From here we'll pick up and see what the Apostle Paul talks about in the rest of the passage in Romans chapter 5. And just remember that what he does for his children, he does out of love. It may not seem like it, but he has our welfare in mind. And I pray that we'll be able to embrace the lessons that Paul gives us regarding that. Let's pray. Father, as we consider who you are in your greatness, in your might, in your power. I realize my own insignificance and inability to properly express <coughs> how you work and how you do things. But indeed, you are the God of heaven and earth, and you are the God who is in control and has authority over all things, and we bow before you. May we embrace what you do in our lives, but we trust that it is for our good. Be with us now as we uh, consider these things today, as we pray in Jesus' name.